are here at the Live Lounge at our Fast Markets Lithium Supply and Battery Raw Materials Conference to interview a range of impressive guests from around the supply chain. I'm Kisa Shreen, your host and guide through this dynamic world of lithium and batteries. As a business and financial author, keynote speaker, and sustainability and risk consultant, I've shared my insights on Bloomberg, CNBC, and CBS. And today we're going to hear some quite interesting insights from our guest. Right now we're joined by Vivas Kumar, CEO and co-founder of Mitrogen. Vivas served as a senior manager at Tesla, where he managed the global battery supply chain and a principal at Benchmark Mineral Intelligence. With a BS in Electrical Engineering from Rice University and an MBA from Stanford, Vivas is at the forefront of battery innovation. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. So to start with, I want to hear a little more about your time at Stanford. You know, I think about it as an innovation hub where a lot of our big tech companies and small tech companies got their start. Talk about the environment and how you managed to really stand out in the crowd here. Well, you're exactly right. And actually, our company was founded at Stanford. My One of my two co-founders is a professor at Stanford's Material Science School. I founded the company when I was still a student. Much of the financing for our company to kick off the company happened because of connections through Stanford. So the innovation and entrepreneurial ecosystem that's built around Stanford University is strong and continues to be strong. And, you know, we're a living example of it. But even a company like Tesla, I mean, the first Tesla headquarters, actually even the current, one of the current Tesla buildings where I used to work, is still on land owned by Stanford University. So, you know, Stanford has gone beyond being a university, just being a a tremendous entrepreneurial ecosystem. And one of the things that they do really well is the cross-pollination of ideas across the campus. I was at the business school and my co-founder is a professor in the engineering school, and yet we were still able to, to meet and come up with this idea together to start this company. And I imagine you didn't have a lot of free time on your hands. How did you manage that? You were still a student. You started this company. How did you go about that? What were your steps? Well, I knew that I wanted to do something in the battery supply chain after I graduated because that's the industry I'd been in, and I saw the tremendous growth that was happening from my time at Tesla. And working at Tesla was intensely inspiring. It was intense and it was inspiring. And I knew that I wanted to stay in batteries. And Professor Will Chu, along with Chiru, who was my third co-founder, who had been one of Professor Chu's postdocs at Stanford back in the day, they, they had been you know, pushing forward on multiple hypotheses in lithium-ion batteries, which were similar to what I had been seeing from the commercial side as well. And so, yeah, I didn't have a lot of time, but you take advantage of the opportunities that are given to you, especially when you're at a place like Stanford. Great, you talk about the entrepreneurial ecosystem there. And I would love for you to talk us through the fundraising piece of it. So if you are a founder, what are the things you need to think about when it comes to how much you need to fundraise and when you need to fundraise? Start by thinking in a 10 year cycle, what do you wanna build and why does that matter to the world? And then break it up into three and five year goals and then break that down into 12 to 18 month goals. You wanna go fundraise for a financeable milestone in that 12 to 18 month period. There are different types of investors who are willing to underwrite different levels of risk throughout the company building journey. And so for us, starting a company completely from scratch, Silicon Valley venture capital was the right type of capital that we needed to get our company going in the very beginning. And so that's the reason why all of our initial fundraising was done within a 10 mile radius of Stanford's campus, which is you know an area that's known as a hotbed for venture capital. But the last financing that we did was led by General Motors because we had moved on beyond needing the type of de-risking offered by venture capital and wanted to get more customer support behind us. And whenever we do our future fundraisings, there will be different types of capital from different parts of the world that are commensurate to the specific needs that we have at that time. And I, I love the start to your answer with us. Think about what the market needs and what's going, what it's going to need in the future. So when we think about market analysis, what are some of the questions an entrepreneur needs to think about if they're saying, huh, let me examine the market and think, to figure out if my hypothesis is correct, if the future really is going to dictate X. What should they be thinking about in terms of looking at the market to find out what the gap is? Start by pinpointing what are some of the global megatrends that are structural, secular, 
and well beyond the remit of any one individual company or country. So let's take the industry that we're in. Lithium and lithium ion batteries is a platform technology for energy storage and electrification in order to help us transition away from fossil fuels and solve climate change. This is a multi-generational problem, one that affects every human around the world, is a focus of the majority of the world's governments, and many companies right now are gearing their strategies around how they could be carbon neutral, how they can come up with new products that are more environmentally sensitive. And so I knew that by starting a lithium ion, by, by starting a company in the lithium ion battery space, that we would be part of a global megatrend that was much larger than us. And when you're building something as part of a trend this large and this globally sweeping in its scale, even if you have a small slice of the pie, that's a multi-billion dollar company right there. You talk a little about investors and your thought process and being in this ecosystem. I'm wondering when you're looking at partners, whether we're talking about merging, acquiring, or just partnering with entities, do you have the same thought process with partners? Are you looking at partners who are solving something that's going to be a gap in the future? Or what kind of key things are you thinking about when you're looking at engaging with partners? Well, we have, first, let me start by saying we have tremendous strategic partners who have joined us in the journey well beyond being financial partner. General Motors is one that I mentioned who led our Series B financing round. But in addition to them, we had TechMet Mercuria, we had GS Group, we had Xeon Corporation. The reason why I'm bringing up all of these names other than to thank them for their support is to say that every single one of them brought a different specific competency in the battery supply chain that we lacked. But we brought certain skills and a specific product thesis that they thought would augment their offering as well. So in the same way that when we were thinking about capitalizing the company in the beginning, we thought about who would be the right capital partners who could underwrite the specific type of risk that we were looking for. In terms of strategic partners, we thought to ourselves, what can we do really well that others may not necessarily be able to do? However, what are the gaps that we have that can be complemented by the skills that they bring? And so when there was a mutual fit, it kind of went off the races at that point in terms of aggregating a, a stellar set of partners that we have in the battery supply chain today. Excellent. Great. Thanks for sharing that. I want to go back in time a bit and talk about your experience working at Tesla. You called it out and said it was inspiring, but it sounds a bit challenging. So you were really putting all systems ago there. Talk to us about the inspiring piece as well as what challenged you and helped you grow. At Tesla, when I joined Tesla, the Model 3 hadn't even come out yet. So it was still a relatively niche automotive company. And when I say niche, I mean in terms of the volumes, but also the specific segments in which it played. And so it went from that. And by the way, this is a company that was going bankrupt every two weeks, to be frank. And so it went from that to being the Western industry leader in electric vehicles and lithium ion batteries. And I think this is, this is a key distinction to note is Tesla is not a car company anymore. Tesla does many things. It's an AI company. It's a robotics company. It's, a, it's the West's largest battery company. And when you're going and innovating in so many different spaces and the growth is so fast, the amount of learning that happens on a professional basis in one year felt like it was equal to three or four years of the job that I had previous to that. And so I appreciated the experience in as much as it prepared me for the entrepreneurial route that I've taken now, which is also an intensely inspiring journey one where there's no textbook with answers and one where you're solving new problems every single day that have never been solved before by you. And although there are other people with whom you surround yourself who may have been exposed to these types of problems in the past, the burden of decision making and propelling forward the company to be a steward of the capital, but also to be responsible to your employees, to be responsible to your suppliers and your customers. This is a level of responsibility that is very noble in and of itself, and one that I had a lot of exposure to because of the tremendous growth that I saw and experienced at Tesla. So that leads us right into corporate culture. You talk about the responsibilities to all your stakeholders, employees, your suppliers, your investors. 
What is your thought behind building corporate culture and how has that led your work and your approach to corporate culture at your firm now? I believe that we need to work long, hard, fast, and smart. You cannot pick a subset of those four. You have to have them all. Why? Because at any given moment, we have to believe and we have to act as if we are one step away from extinction. That's true of every single startup company. That's how we felt all the time at Tesla, which is what allowed the whole company to get to the conclusion that it has been able to reach today. And that's how I feel every single day, even running this company, Metrichem. And I'm inspired by the fact that many of our team members feel the same way. They work long, hard, fast, and smart towards this noble goal of bringing decarbonization materials at scale to solve climate change. The other part of corporate culture that I very strongly believe in is having small and focused teams. So what you oftentimes see happening to technology companies is once they reach a certain level of de-risking, the primary metric of success ends up becoming how can you hire more people rather than how can you deploy the technology as far and wide as possible to have as much impact as possible. And the metric of success that we are going for is always going to be tied to what is our climate impact. It's not going to be about you know, how many dollars we make. It's not going to be about how many people we hire. It's what is the impact that our technologies are having. Because making lots of money, being a very employable company, delivering returns to your shareholders, these things happen naturally as a consequence of focusing on your product and focusing on creating great technology. So I want to dig into that and think about the characteristics that you look for when you are hiring or bringing folks into your organization. And also, we know that sometimes how you got in is not how you stay in. So when you're hiring, you look for certain characteristics. But in order to retain top talent and make sure that they're moving in the same direction, you want to make sure that they maybe have a different, slightly different skill set. So what are you looking for in terms of when you onboard someone initially? And then what are you looking for as they grow with the company? Any corporation is a pyramid. And you have leadership at the top, and then you have lots of team members who are executing the tasks necessary. So there's three levels in which I think about this. And I would think about this in terms of shooting an arrow at a bullseye. The executive team identifies the bullseye, the management team aims towards the bullseye, and the team members shoot for the bullseye. Now on this note, the skills needed to do each of those three different jobs are very different, as you just mentioned yourself. Most of the hiring happens at the team member level of the company. This is a relatively new industry and a relatively small industry in the global scheme, the one that we're operating in. So what does that mean? You're not necessarily going to easily find a hundred different candidates with deep experience in LFP cathode materials who are available to be hired and are English speaking in the West and are excited by your company at any given moment. However, what you're gonna find is really talented and motivated chemical engineers and material scientists who are curious about technologies to solve climate change and are motivated by the promise of being in a fast-growing technology company and what it can do for their career and what they can do for the world in it. So at the team member level, we screen heavily for character as much as we screen for competence. And even for competence, we're not looking for specific competence as much as we're looking for general competence and aptitude to learn. Now, as you get closer and closer to the executive levels, it does help to have industry experience and industry knowledge, context and contacts. We do work in an industry where supplier relationships are tightly held, where there's a very small number of highly influential customers and the government carries a very, very strong mandate to invest behind this industry. So when I think about how to put together the appropriate executive team, I am looking for competence as much as character, and competence contacts, context, and character, but anybody can grow into that kind of role with enough time exposure in this industry, especially in a fast-growing industry. Look, I, I was very fortunate in the early part of my career to go work at Tesla, to go work for Elon, with whom I've worked very closely, and it was a very life-changing time, and it's what allowed me to be able to work on this company and inspired me to go after climate change for the rest of my life. So for those of us, for, for those of the people who are in my company, who are team members in our company, they're here for the same reason. They see that there's huge growth potential for themselves and for this industry, and it's solving an important problem. 
have they been exposed to all of the nuances of cathode chemistry in the past? Maybe not, but will they get exposed to it and will they learn about it by being part of this company and having an open mind? Sure they will. I love that, open and curious. It sounds like those are two of the main things that you look for. Um, I'm wondering if we get personal and talk about your experiences and talk about perhaps the most, uh, the opportunity that gave you the most growth, the opportunity that maybe was the most challenging for you. Some people might say, call that a failure. Some people might say, no, it wasn't a failure. It was simply a growing experience. Could you talk about an opportunity that you've had a chance to really grow and maybe the outcome didn't come out the exact way that you want it to, but you saw that in the long term, it taught you so much more. Well, every single day as an entrepreneur, you shoot for a huge outcome and there ends up being some level of disappointment because your ambition is so large that the outcome is never gonna measure up. But if you look back on a long enough time span, you're amazed at what you can achieve. So even if I think about this company, we are, so three years ago today, we closed our first financing in this company. Um, and it was the same day that I graduated from Stanford Business School. And if I think about three years from now, we were just three founders. We didn't have an office. We had kind of a thesis of what we were trying to solve in the industry. But today, we make products at pilot scale. We're in deep qualification with 25 different customers all over the world. We've been able to raise several tens of millions of dollars from really brand name customers and financial investors. We've come a very long way. And every single individual day in the last three years since that first financing closed has had some mix of technical success or commercial success or financing success, but also failures in all those three categories. But the integrated value compounded over time has been the company that we have, which is a product thesis that serves many different customers at the right timing, where there's a significant confluence of legislation, policy, and funding from governments all over the world, and a team of 60 strong between California and South Korea that's working towards advancing our mission of bringing decarbonization materials to the world. So, so if you're talking to your team, would, and a team member felt that they failed, they failed you, they failed themselves, would you encourage them to lean into what they did, experience that? Or would you say, let's look at the grand scheme of things. Let's look, let's look at this in the grand scope of what we're producing. How would you approach that? Failure is permanent only if you don't try again. So my, and I, I love to brag about this because we're recording this on June 25th of 2024 and the Paris Olympics starts in a month. So my brother-in-law is an athlete in the Olympics and he loves to talk about how he, he does fencing. Every single point is just a point. If you lose the point, go up for the next point and try to win that next point. Your probability of winning each point is the same as the point before it. Self-delusion is what causes you to lose point after point if you believe that you're on a bad streak. Likewise, if you're on a hot streaking winning point after point, never take it for granted because the next point is not gonna be as easy as you think just because you've won the last five points in a row. So likewise, in an entrepreneurial journey, right, I love the athletics field because it teaches you how to win with grace and lose with passion to want to go back and win again. And as an entrepreneur, because there's daily successes and failures, every day is just a point. The next day is about getting up and doing it better than you did the day before. I'm wondering too, as I listen to you, this, this sounds very inspirational. This sounds like Definitely, it's something that folks could listen to on a regular basis to remind themselves of that. Do you have a favorite, say, podcast or book or something that you use to remind yourself of that? Is it just innate? Do you not need a reminder? Or is it something that you can go to? A lot to? of this is lived personal experience. I want to go back to the time at Tesla. This was the most shorted stock in the world. This was, you know, Elon was tweeting all the time crazy things. And... Every two weeks, we were about to go bankrupt, like I said, back in 2018. And this company defied all of the odds and became the global leader in setting the trend of electric vehicle technology just a couple of years after that. So with my own eyes, I saw what happened when the company rose up against the odds, the team that I was with rose up against the odds. And so because of that, my lived personal experience of seeing that in an entrepreneurial journey of which I played a very small role that's the reason why I bring the same attitude to this company that I'm doing now. And in terms of books and podcasts, I mean, I really like to read stories of great men and great women in history who have overcome significant odds themselves. So biographies of 
it, it always, almost always ends up being political leaders because for a long time in history, you had to lead a nation to be exposed to this kind of opportunity for inspiring large groups of people. Capitalism as a force in the way that it is today didn't really start until the 1700s. And so you have a lot of business biographies from that point in time. So, you know, I'm thinking about people like John D. Rockefeller, Cornelius Vanderbilt, Carnegie. Um, Andrew Carnegie, but then also, like I said, great political leaders. Margaret Thatcher is one that I specifically like. Um, but also going back in time, Catherine the Great, Joan of Arc. I mean, these are people who stood up against the conventional norms at the time and created a tremendous positive outcome for the world in doing that. I believe that every entrepreneurial adventure that anybody can take, you can learn something from studying these kinds of stories from people who overcame the odds. So speaking of stories, I want to go back to 10-year-old Vivas when he was probably just in the thick of listening and learning about new stories. If you could talk to him, your younger self, what advice would you give him? What would you tell him to either stay the course on, to shift or do differently? What well, would you say? When I was 10 years old, I was actually living in Singapore. And I think this is another great example. Singapore, in the 1960s when the country gained independence, this was a backwater third world country and got completely lifted up into being one of the most developed and efficient and safe countries in the world. Some of the best healthcare and education and social security you can find anywhere in the scope of just two generations. And so this is what happens. It's an entrepreneurial state. It's not a country. It's a place where there was strong leadership and people worked long, hard, fast, and smart. I saw it with my own eyes also growing up, what happens to an entire society when the same concepts I'm talking about over here are applied. So what I would say, going back to my 10-year-old self, is understand that the change that you're seeing in the country happening around you, because even between, even the entire 1990s, when I lived in Singapore, when I was sentient and conscious and seeing it happen, you know, I was wondering, why does the place feel more international? Why does the place feel more different? And if I could go back, I would have appreciated a little bit more that, you know, I was in this unique country and this unique moment in history where that level of social uplifting doesn't really happen anymore in many different places in the world. I'm wondering with that being said, um, there are lots of things that I'm sure people know about you that you've shared today. That was an excellent vignette. And I want to dive deeper to see if there is a fun fact, something that people don't know about you that maybe you don't share a lot, but it gives us a deep insight into your character in the same way that that story did. So some, whether it's you like to play certain types of sports, but something that we well, don't know Well, I am a sports addict. Okay. Like I, I, and I just, anything that is competitive really gets me going. Okay. Um, one of, so growing up, I think Michael Schumacher was probably my favorite athlete. Um, and, you know, Lewis Hamilton now is doing a tremendous job of, of breaking all the records. And, and that's something I love to see. It's when you have an athlete who broke all the records and then you grow up long enough to see another athlete come along and break all those records all over again. We saw this already happen with Roger Federer in tennis, right? He broke all the records before him. And now we have the next generation. We have Carlos Alcaraz coming up trying to break all the records, right? I grew up watching Michael Jordan break all the records. And now LeBron James is here trying to break all the records again. So His son might be next, but... That's another story. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, Bronny might be next, right? And that's the thing. Every single, every single person wants to outdo the generation before them in a very positive way to propel the country and not the country, excuse me, the sport forward. Um, the reason why I said country is I was thinking about Singapore again, where Lee Kuan Yew was the prime minister of Singapore for 30 years and the son became prime minister and wanted to outdo his dad and do even better for the next generation after that. So a lot of these lessons also come back in sports, which is why I'm very excited for the fact that a member of my, my close nuclear family is an Olympic athlete, gotten to dip my toe a lot more to the business of sports because of this. Um, my wife is his manager and agent, and the business of sports is just as competitive as the sport itself. So you know, that's been an interesting hobby of mine to do outside of Mitricam is the, the US Olympic Committee, the FIE, the Fencing As Association, um, the U.S. Fencing Association just being involved with all of these different parties and seeing how um, so much business is driven in addition to the national pride 
of being an Olympic athlete. Is there a huge learning curve? Can you say, you know what, the skills, the talents, the tools that I use at Metricam, I'm using them, them here with, with my brother-in-law with fencing. Are, are there some unique things that you had to pick up on the job, so to speak? Here's the thing. Technologies change, new products come and go, but human psychology never changes. And it is the same from business arena to arena. Humans are always driven by incentives, by a competitive desire to win, but they're also driven by the desire to be social creatures and form bonds with other people. So regardless of who ends up winning or losing the sport, if you came out of it having made multiple friends, then you're a better human for it. I mean, I think about it, this is my ninth year in a row coming to this Fast Markets conference, which considering how young the industry is, you know, it probably kind of makes me a veteran at this point within this industry. On stage, right before this, I spoke with an entire panel of people that I met at my first ever Fast Markets conference. Right? And we're all still in the industry, and all of us have moved on to doing different things. I was at Tesla at the time, these individuals were at different places at the time, now I'm an entrepreneur, and they're pursuing different journeys of their own in the industry. But we're all still here exchanging ideas about the industry, having gone through the ups and downs and the cycles, and still here helping each other get to the aggregate industry being in a better position so that all of us can benefit. So I want to close this out going back to that noble ideal and that noble work that you talk about. If there is someone, an entrepreneur, who's interested in building a community specifically to do this noble work, how would you recommend that they not only just meet people, but they build and sustain a community that they can do business with, that they can All right, can I give a with? very self-serving answer? So, self-serve away. Move to Silicon Valley immediately. Really? In the last eight years, where I have been a resident of Silicon Valley, I have seen, and by the way, I've gone to, at Tesla, I was very fortunate. I went to 50 different countries to do business. Even in this job, we have a, a great cap table of investors and strategic partners around the world I think I spent, last year, I think I spent 250 days of the year on the road. And so I have the tremendous blessing to have a lot of global exposure in my job. The density of talent and capital and ideas in Silicon Valley is unlike anywhere else that I've seen in the world. It's a unique moment in global history that so much technology has come out of the 50 square miles that is Silicon Valley. I mean, think about the number of trillion dollar companies that have been birthed in our lifetimes just in this one small area. And that's, that's not even to make mention of the multi-billion dollar companies, the multi-hundred million dollar companies, the multi-tens of millions of dollars companies, each of which are huge employers, propel forward technology and propel forward the human existence. Stanford University, I'm very lucky to count myself as a member of that community, sits right in the heart of it. And that's where I really got my first foray into seeing that density of talent and capital and ideas all in one place. And you know, I was fortunate to be able to go to Stanford. It's not an opportunity that everybody has, but geographically being able to move to Silicon Valley is one that more people can have. And I would highly recommend it, especially to any young people in your career. I was still in my 20s when I moved to Silicon Valley and it was life-changing. What, what I'm doing now with my ability to be a productive member of this industry that we're in is possible because of the exposure that I had because I was given an opportunity there. So exposure and being at the right place is key. Also, making it better, not just for your generation, but when the next generation comes along, friendly competition to be better than that prior generation. And also competence, context, and character key to what Vivas is looking for when he hires and when he selects his team. Very, very just amazing content. Thank you so much for joining us, Vivas. This is great. Thank you for having me. Thank you to Fast Markets for consistently inviting me back. And to everybody who's listening out there, keep up the good work. Climate change is a global problem, a multi-generational problem. Every single one of you plays a role. And even if you're sitting there and wondering, well, you know, I, I don't really know what I can do, even just in your daily individual choices around your energy consumption, your water consumption, your waste, make intelligent choices just to incrementally decrease your carbon footprint so that we can all live in a much cleaner world. Well, I couldn't have said that any better myself, so I'll leave it there and I won't. But thank you so much to all of our Live Lounge listeners. And whether you're listening in person or catching up, don't forget to subscribe to catch up on all of our other episodes. You can find these on YouTube, Spotify, Apple, Podbean, SoundCloud, or wherever you get your content. And if you want to find out more about other events in this space that we are working on, head to the events section at fastmarkets.com. 
I'm Kisa Shree. Thank you for joining.